Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Tonight, I'm going to do um, chapter 2 in the Gospel of John, just this normal way this time. And I'm just going to try to help those who may be so new at Christianity, you've not ever seen a movie about Jesus. I'm going to try to help you imagine what it must have looked like, okay? Now, if you watch John 1, parts 1, you know, 1 and 2, you kind of got an idea of how they dressed. They didn't wear pants and suits like we men do now and, you know, ladies dressed. They kind of dressed alike, if, you know, if you think about it. They all wore long gowns. Okay, and that's just for someone who's never watched an a Jesus movie or seen a, a Bible with pictures or anything like that. Okay. Trying to help the Bible come alive. And most of you, I'm sure, have watched at least one Jesus movie. Jesus of Nazareth or The Passion by Mel Gibson. Boy, was that a, it was sad. It was a good one. It, it had some little weird things in it, but Still, man, I bawled to that one. It was so sad. It just showed how much Jesus loves us and what he went through for us. Anyway, moving on. I'm gonna st I am in the Blue Letter Bible. And I am in the NASB. And when I feel the urge, I will go to the King James Version. But first, let me... I should have done this already. I have to remember... I can't read as well with these old glasses, so let's put these on. Okay, and here we go. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now, I'm kind of wondering here, on the third day, I'm just going to back up to the end of John 1. All right? So if I click on this, it's it's trying. You know, some people might think that doing these gospels over again might be too redundant. Well, so move on to something more meatier. You know, meaty, like there's, they talk about the meat. There's the milk for the babes in Christ, and then there's the meat. But I've had a very hard time doing this Bible series, getting started, getting it done, it taking so many hours. And now look, okay, it finally went. That's weird. It should have went just like that. All right, so I'm going to go to the end and find out because you might be wondering in the, on the third day of what. All right, Jesus was talking to them. Um, he, remember, he'd started picking his apostles. He'd found Andrew who went and got Simon Peter. And Jesus told him, you shall be called Cephas. The next day, he went to Galilee and found Philip. And Philip found Nathaniel. Okay. Uh, Philip told Nathaniel, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So they came. So now he's got five. Jesus saw, sees Nathanael coming, and he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. See, Jesus knows everything about you. So here, here they are. Um, okay, so I wanted to make sure, because of my memory, and to help anybody else who, you know, it's been a couple days since we watched. And I know there are folks having problems with their memories. So I wanted to recap the end of this one to make sure they weren't at some feast. And I didn't think they were. He's just talking to them. 
Okay, so then here we go back to chapter 2. So it, it's strange how it starts out on the third day. This must be on the third day after he started picking apostles. That's the only uh, explanation I can come of that. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Now, I sat under the teachings of a good pastor one time at an Assemblies of God church who said he felt like, I think it was at the Assemblies of God. At any rate, it was um, some pastor I've been to in my life said they thought maybe this was one of Jesus's sisters. And because A, he was invited and his disciples. Like, since he was invited, he could bring his friends. Unless the town of Nazareth, was one of these where everybody was invited, okay? That could be an exclama uh, explanation. However, Mary got involved, okay? Verse 3. Um, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. She went to Jesus and said, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. Now, I'm going to switch this to King James Version because I'm pretty sure the word is me. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? What have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Hmm. What he's saying, why should you bring this problem to me? I know what you want, and it's not time for me to do miracles, he's trying to tell her, knowing all along what he's going to do. He knows it all along. Okay, so that's the difference in those two translations. Moving back to NASB, it goes to, let me move this down. My hour has not yet come. Verse 5, his mother just goes right on to say, now remember, what's written in the Bible, what the Holy Spirit had, these men that penned the Bible, that wrote out the books of the Bible, there, there's a lot of detail we don't know. It's apparently not important. Because at the very end of this book that we're studying, it's going to say, if everything he did had been written down, the world would not be able to contain the volumes. I believe that's how it's put. We'll find out at the end of John. But it doesn't matter. The point is we don't know every detail. So apparently it is not important for us to know what happened in between him saying, my hour has not yet come. And then verse 5, his mother goes on to saying to the servants, whatever he says you do or to do, do it. So she's Barking orders, basically, knowing that he's going to do it for her. So clearly he had awesome respect for his mother. And doesn't the Bible, didn't the Old Testament tell them, honor thy father and thy mother? So he would have never dishonored his mother. And she knew it. She knew who he was. She knew what he was going to do. And she knew that he would do it. All right. Moving on to verse 6. That does not mean he elevated her to the position that she is in in the Catholic Church or any other denomination 
or any other beliefs that puts her as the queen of heaven. She's just not there. And we are not to pray to her. That is wrong, people. I hate to tell the ones of you that do. Because there might be some Catholic folks on here. And I'm glad you're here and wanting to learn. But you must stop praying to Mary. Okay? She would want you to. And Jesus wants you to. Alright. But he obeyed her. Whatever he says to you, do it. Verse 6. Now, there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. So if you can imagine 20 or 30, so there was two sizes, six stone water pots. They're like vases. Big, big around and tall, very tall. I know you can't see me, but I would imagine four feet tall or so, depending on how wide. Can you imagine carrying that thing? 30 gallons of water. Think of a 30 gallon water uh, heater, a water heater. Some water heaters hold 20, some hold 30. That's big. They had to have been bigger than even they show in the movies. Because when you think of it in terms of a water, hot water heater, some of you men have put them in. You women have seen them. If you haven't, you will. They're big. Moving on. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them to the brim. Verse 8. And he said to them, draw some out now. In other words, dip some out and take it to the head waiter. The footnote says, and usually it's instantly there. It's saying loading. Okay, the head waiter if I switch it over to King James Version, it's going to take just as long. He's the guy that put the wedding together, like the wedding planner, okay? So they took it to him. That's not the word that would come up. That's basically what, what he means. All right, when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, parentheses, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, Closed parentheses. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. So it wasn't just wine, it was good wine. Okay, verse 11. This beginning of his signs, oh, see now it just picked it right up as footnote, or for the word signs, attesting miracles, for example, one which points to the supernatural power of God in redeeming grace. Well, I don't know why, why they added in redeeming grace. Keep in mind always when you're reading your Bibles, commentaries and footnotes may be helpful, but they were just, they're the word of, of men. Scholars, hopefully, that have studied, hopefully they're right, but they're not always right. I can tell you that. The Holy Spirit has showed me in my favorite NASB Bible, it has a lot of commentaries and footnotes. Um, some of them are not right. They are not totally right, but it is a sign, a miracle that showed that Jesus had supernatural power. All right, moving on. 
This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And his disciples believed in him. They knew there was something special about this guy and chose to follow him. Now remember what I told you about what Nathaniel said? Jesus said to Nathaniel, um, he saw him when he was under the fig tree, and Nathaniel said, Truly you are the Son of God. And he said, This you say because I said you were under the fig tree? Surely you will see more than this. You see what I'm talking about? And now it's saying, and his disciples believed in him. Well, maybe the rest of them weren't quite where Nathaniel was. Okay. See, that's what I'm saying. Not every detail is in, in the Bible. But if it was, it'd be so many volumes, people wouldn't read it. So keep that in mind. When, when the Lord gives us a message or a dream or a vision and we share it, Sometimes we'll get comments and people will say, that's not biblical. I can't find that in the Bible anywhere. Well, you may not. <laughs> because if it had been written down, like I said, too big to read. All right, moving on. This beginning, and keep in mind, 22 books of the Bible have been removed. Okay. Let's see. Verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Okay, so they were in Cana, not Nazareth, which could be, still could have been one of her daughters, and, and Cana could be where the man was from. Remember, in the Jewish custom, the man and woman got betrothed. Then he went back to his father's house to prepare a place for them to live. Okay? Which is what Jesus is doing for us now. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. We'll come to that. Okay. Okay. So they all went down to Capernaum, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables okay so for brand new Christians who don't know anything about the Bible let me quickly say in the Old Testament part of the the law that they had to keep had to do with animal sacrifices they had to have a certain kind of animal unblemished firstborn um, Oh, it's all out. It's all out in Leviticus and in, in the in the first five books. What they call the Tanakh, um, the Talmud, the Torah, all these animal sacrifices, and they did them day and night, twice a day, burning animals for forgiveness of sins, for uh, for when a baby was born, and they would have that purification ritual, or for when. Oh, gosh, there were so many different reasons, but mostly for forgiveness of sins, for cleansing and purification. They were offering it up to God, and it even says in um, one of those books, um, God actually loved the fat. He loves the aroma of the fat. Isn't that strange? Anyway, moving on. 
That's why they were selling animals. So people could come and not have to bring their own. They could just pay money for a cow or a sheep or a dove, whatever kind of sacrifice they needed to make and get their animal and take it in there to the high priest. Okay? So, they were, let's see, and money changers. All right, let me explain money changers. It's like when you go to France, you've got to change your American dollars into euros. I guess they use euros in France. Most of them do, I think. Don't yell at me if I got that wrong, because I know there's been something going on with euro. Anyway, they had another kind of money. And one kind of money was worth more than another kind of money. You know how that goes. So, so somebody from, let's say they were Jews, but they were from Egypt, so they had Egyptian money. They had to exchange their Egyptian money for money, J Jerusalem money, whatever. I, you know, I have no knowledge of where the different divisions took place as to whose money was worth more than the next person's money. All right. So, verse 14 says, And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables who would give people the money that they needed to buy their cow or sheep with their money. Okay, I hope I made that clear. Verse 15, now listen to what God does. Jesus, this is Jesus now. He made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple. He was angry and he was whipping that thing around and driving them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and he overturned the tables, knocking them over. Things went flying. You can imagine that, right? And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. I couldn't have found a good picture for that. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And it did. He got angry and it was righteous anger. And you might think he did wrong doing that. But he was letting them know they were turning his father's house into a den of thieves, a place of business. The King James says, I'll try to change it. Let's see, that's verse 16. Good, it switched fast. Maybe we just had a temporary lockup in the internet system. All right. This says, verse 16, And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Okay, this happens in another place, and that must be where it says den of thieves. Okay, but you get the point. Jesus was mad, and he drove them out. All right. For making his ha father's house a place of business. John verse two, chapter 2 verse 17 says, Oh, and his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then Jews said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? They got mad at him. Of course. Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, he was talking about his body as the temple, not the building. They thought he was crazy. 
verse 20. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? Verse 21. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Verse 22. This is John 2, 22. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. See, all the way up to then and beyond, they had their doubts and problems believing certain things. It took Jesus dying and raising from the dead for them to believe and understand this saying, okay? So it's understandable if you have doubts about a verse here or there, and you're struggling with understanding the word. Just keep praying that the Lord will fill you and fill you and fill you with more and more Holy Spirit because you need him to help you understand okay now verse 23 now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast many believed in his name observing his signs which he was doing remember signs are miracles verse 24 but Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them for he knew all men verse 25 and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man for he himself knew what was in man and that's the end of chapter 2 I pray that what I have said has been correct uh, and that I explained it well and helped bring a picture in your mind as to what 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 happened so that the Bible became a little more alive and the personality of Jesus how he felt about his father's house And I pray this blessed you. Before I started the video, I did pray that the Holy Spirit would do all the talking outside of the scriptures. So I pray that he has done that and that somebody learned something. Okay, I plead the blood of Jesus over this video and over the internet connection and over each and every one of you as well. And with that, I'll say bye for now, and I'll talk to you later.